Now, moving on towards the counselor mode, here's something I learned over a couple of years as a university crisis counselor is that often people are just looking for a sympathetic ear and will go to extremes to find it. One of the most powerful but short sentences in a counselor's arsenal is simply to say, I hear you. And sometimes you don't even need to say anything beyond that, since that's all they're really looking for. Next is to let the student vent a little and to relieve the pressure. Now, it doesn't need to be an especially deep or lengthy conversation. It can't be. We don't, we don't have the time nor necessarily the expertise to offer that. But we can let the student detail any frustrations in a faculty one-to-one -one message and take it out of the discussion room and then respond as well as we possibly can. Now, the problem could be as simple as relieving some of the insecurities and defensiveness of an older re-entry student, which many of them are. And I was an older returning student, and I'll sometimes let them know that, that I understand how intimidating it can be. And to us, they may be just another student working through the program, but what they really are is a person looking to make for themselves a better life, and perhaps they're recovering from some catastrophic event, such as the loss of a job or a divorce, or trying to reestablish an identity. And most of us can somehow relate to that, and sharing a bit of our own example with the student can be very effective. Of course, quite often the student's needs go beyond our abilities or availability, and that's why college and university advisors are there to help deal with that. But still, we can often relieve the impacts of a disruptive student, perhaps a fearful student, by simply, simply letting them vent a little and, again, simply saying, you know, I hear you, which can be remarkably effective. Moving on again into the corrections mode. Sometimes people reach a point in antisocial behavior where educating or counseling them simply doesn't work, and they need a good dose of reality therapy to let them know just where the limits are, that beyond a certain point, a wall comes crashing down and they're removed from normal society. Now, my job for the Oregon Department of uh, Corrections, however brief, was to do a, an intake risk assessment of felon probationers and parolees. What kind of threat did they pose to the community? Now, if people want to destroy themselves, there's not much we can do about that, but we do owe it to the community to protect them against threats and disruption. Starting with defining the limits and enforcing them. And we need to do the same in our classroom. We cannot allow one student to derail the learning of others. And sometimes a disruptive student simply needs to bounce against the limits of the program. And that's where we need to make sure our sense of mercy is balanced by a sense of justice and what's right. Sometimes as instructors, we may be a little softer in our approach, granting students greater latitude than they may find in the working world or society at large. This isn't always a favor. Yes, we should be supportive and compassionate, but for the student's sake and the well-being of the classmates, we need to have clearly defined limits and not go beyond those. And that's only fair to everyone in the course, and it's ultimately in the best interest of the students who may be pushing to see just how far the rules can be stretched. And balance the interests of one with the interests of the group. For example, one minor example. A student was facing an upcoming hospital stay, and she was working fast ahead on her tasks. And I accommodated her, to disrupting my own flow and forcing me to prepare materials for a new class a week or more in advance. But then she asked to have a team assigned to her in advance, and that I declined, since that would impose on other students who were preoccupied with their current tasks. And of course, call for backup when needed. And it's not always clear just what to do, or for that matter, even just what a problem is. And that's where an instruction team or deans or coaches and mentors are there to help. And typically, they're sympathetic and supportive with some detached objectivity on what may be a disruptive model. I believe there's a clarifying power to naming something. It helps to get a handle on what a problem might be. Now, some disruptive behavior can be attributed to what others have called the mad student syndrome. 
I use angry student syndrome for the cool anagram. And that's where students may be unhappy with a grade, but rather than consider it as some fault of their own, they turn it back on the instructor or the course materials or their classmates as the real poor performers, and often they do it publicly in the classroom discussions and forums. This is when strong police action is required and the walls drop down. Students should not be allowed to pollute the learning environment of others, and these angry student situations are typically evident for what they are. So here's a summary overview of how to deal with disruptive students. First, to address the problems while they're small. Recognize the trouble signs such as incrementally escalating conflicts. And then to work as a control rod and absorb the radioactivity in a classroom when necessary. And then seek ways to turn conflict into learning, maybe assigning a research project or perhaps having them work in a team. And then help the students feel connected. And remember, simply saying, I hear you, can be three very powerful words. Also, set the limits. Once people know where the walls are, they'll often stop pushing and know when to lower the boom. And we have a duty to protect the learning environment of our students. Finally, stay in contact with your coaches and mentors and your instruction support team and your deans and department heads. That's what they're there for, and they may be able to help you deal with some of the pressures before you melt down and turn into a disruptive instructor, and that's a different topic. I'm sure I've missed some uh, good tips. If you have some you'd like to share, send me an email, and perhaps we can include them in future presentations.